what we will be talking about today is what is web accessibility, why it matters, how you can help, and Katarzyna will give you more practical examples later on. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, usually what, I, what I've had experience with what works is a little empathy lab. So we will do that in the end to somehow see how people with disabilities use the web. So what is web accessibility? I was thinking uh, a lot about how to explain this and uh, I, I get asked this question all the time when I talk to someone, so where do you work? And I say, I work on web accessibility and they stare me in the eyes like, what is it? So first of all, it's a long word and it's difficult to write. So every time I have to put it in an email, I'm checking, do I have all the C's? Do I have all the S's? Do I have all the E's and et cetera. So that's why there is actually an abbreviation A11Y. And that's what I try to use. But if you have a shortcut for me to use in an email, every time I have to type this word, please contact me. I would be very happy to get that. Um, I've been working in this field only since 14 months, so I'm a relatively new web accessibility uh, enthusiast. And uh, what I love most about this is that I learn every day more and more. And that's why I'm saying we will do only a brief introduction. We will just to give you two definitions. And that's why I put web in brackets, because obviously accessibility is much more than only about online content. Um, in the broadest term, this is the ability to be used by everyone and it can refer to products, services, cars, really old transport, trains, etc., environments, content and more. And web accessibility about ensuring that everyone using your content, trying to access your content or interact it, including really people with disabilities can do that and it applies to uh, internet, mobile devices, etc. That's why I use this uh, picture and I will explain it to those. Maybe we have some audience that have visual impairments and they can't see. So I've used a picture of a girl on a wheelchair wearing this Batman red cap because it is empowering. Uh, but we do see or we tend to see accessibility or people with disabilities as disabilities that are uh, that we can perceive that are visible but accessibility really covers widest range of capabilities whether they are visual uh, visual hearing motor impairments or cognitive um, disabilities so about 80 percent of disabilities are invisible and it's good to think about that Different people benefit is the title of this slide. And you can see, or I will try to explain that there is a person with one arm, but there is also a person that is has a broken arm or has an arm injury. And there is presumably a, a father holding his newborn child, which means that by designing or by since this is a clear writing conference by preparing documents of writing materials for someone who has a permanent disability, you are also creating content for people who have, for example, only a temporary or situational disability or impairment. So that's why I will keep repeating this throughout my presentation, but it benefits every one of us. And I will show you in the next example why uh, Microsoft produced this very nice um, overview or chart or leaflet, be it what it is, where it shows you exactly the senses can, which can be affected and also that the disabilities are not all of them are permanent. And as we age, we can develop some disabilities impairments, but we can find ourselves in a situation where we are unable to do something. For example, if I'm holding my child, one only, I don't have twins luckily, but let's imagine I can't use a mouse now. So I would depend on being able to navigate 
for example, I'm booking tickets because I really need to go somewhere sunny, although it's nice and sunny in Brussels now, but I need to be able to operate and navigate the website with a keyboard. So that's why the key, the, the website needs to be keyboard uh, operable. Uh, or you are outside. It's really now nice and sunny, direct sunlight. You have to increase or decrease the contrast on your mobile device because otherwise you won't be able to see what's in it. So there are really many situations where you can uh, find yourself in a need of an accessibility feature. And as I've said already, uh, there are uh, disabilities that are invisible and you wouldn't be able to tell that I have a disability because it is invisible. Um, there is a very nice video and once we share the presentations, um, you can click on it because and, and watch it when you have time. It's 14 minutes. Obviously, I won't have time now to show it to you. Uh, but the Publications Office of the Commission prepared uh, this, this short video about how people with disabilities use the web. And um, it's very interesting to, to know what are really the assistive technologies that people uh, with disabilities use and how these assistive technologies can help you as well, because they are not only hardware, but they are software as well. So, for example, you would use an ebook or for watching a video when you are on a public transport, I don't think that you would go, at least the audience here, I think I can say for sure that you wouldn't go and watch it with the volume loud up. So you would prefer to watch it with captions on. So these are all assistive technologies that help people with disabilities. But again, repeating what I've already said can be useful for everyone. Why it matters um, by not giving enough access to, to information to people, we affect their rights to education, to services, etc. So if we don't produce accessible communication, we are creating invisibility to these people and we are discriminating them so as not to marginalize anyone and especially in this month of inclusion and um, diversity it is important to to repeat this and you never know who is in your audience it happened to me very recently that i was perfectly confident oh yes we have a wide audience but i don't know if there are people with disabilities and then we shared the presentation and a blind person comes back to me saying, I wasn't able to read your presentation because it was not accessible enough for me. And although we, we made it accessible by publishing it on a platform which somehow distorted the PowerPoint, we made it inaccessible again. So we had to find ways how to, how to do this. So it's really, you. it's better to think about your audience is also including people who might not always uh, be able to perceive what you are presenting. And as we were discussing with Katarzyna earlier, it is the law. It's not only the right or good thing to do. So the EU is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And hence, it's produced two pieces of legislation with the Web Accessibility Directive, which applies to um, public institutions, and the European Accessibility Act, which uh, applies to private companies as well. And since we want to uh, do what we preach, uh, the European Commission as an institution adopted last year the Web Accessibility Action Plan. Uh, which has six action areas with concrete outcomes and timelines. You can find it publicly available on the Europa Web Guide, which is our rule book for the web community. And we try to implement this action plan uh, as we speak. So we are in touch with all the directorates general and make sure that their websites are as compliant as they can be. There are rules for public websites and the European Commission and the institutions being public institutions. Uh, we comply or we ask our websites to be compliant with the web content accessibility guidelines uh, version 2.1. There are three levels in these um, guidelines, level A, level AA, level AAA. Of course, if you can go to level AAA, even better. 
but the minimum level for us is double A. And there is also a technical standard uh, EN301549. So these two, I will touch on those uh, a bit later on. Uh, we also ask the, the websites that we have in the Europa domain, there are roughly uh, between 750 to 800. They appear and disappear weekly. Uh, we have really many, many websites. So we try to coordinate it and we ask them to have an accessibility statement published. Like that, they will show the users that they care and they will identify the non-accessible content on their websites. And plus, part of the accessibility statement is a feedback mechanism whereby the users can contact you to, to uh, ask about something or to signal if there is inaccessible content that is not mentioned in the accessibility statement. So these are at least uh, a few things that we require our websites to follow in terms of web accessibility. Now, a more practical side how you can help. Uh, and I've seen that accessibility is part of your daily life. So I can imagine you're already helping enough. But I found this another nice source um, saying basically anyone can help and we all have a role to play in accessibility. So where whether you are producing content, you can, I will have the links at the end of my presentation that will be shared with you. So as an as a, as a author of a content for websites, but also in the documents, you can download this, print this, put this in front of you so that you can look at it. And what I specifically like about this uh, piece of nice chart is the keys. So in the legend, you have symbols. So for example, if you are writing something, and this is really the topic of this whole com conference and um, uh, workshops, by avoiding jargon, you are helping people with cognitive disabilities. So people with dyslexia, attention deficit disorder, some sorts of autism, etc. By creating structure, you are helping not only people with cognitive disabilities, but also blind people because their screen reader will be able to properly read your content. So you can see these little symbols for each tip. I think it's very useful. I have the same for designers, but there are more. So please, I really encourage you to go to that link and then you can see for yourself what you uh, find useful and what you can uh, print. What now I have for you is the empathy lab, uh, what I've been talking about. So please, uh, now is the time to take out your uh, mobile phones, scan the QR code. If it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't. And I really hope it will. Uh, you can also type uh, on your mobile colorblind SIM. There is nothing that you need to download. Just please allow access to your camera because you will need it. Do we have it? Okay, it works. So once you have it, there is in the uh, left upper corner a hamburger menu, if I remember correctly, there should be a hamburger menu. And then in that one, choose Protonopia. Yes, it's called, should be called Protonopia. That's what I remember, but I haven't tested it yesterday. Yeah, okay, good. So we all have it, more or less, not. Some of, okay, if, I mean, uh, if some have it, you can also try it at home. Uh, then I would like you to direct your phone at the screen so that it works. Now I want all the audience with their mobile phones like that, okay? And I'm your boss and I will tell you that your deadline is on a pink post-it. So look through your mobile, please. Can you guess which deadline it is? <laughs> Now you can put down your phone to see which, which is the ping posted. You can try it on any website. It really, I found it very helpful to see, for example, on maps, charts. If you have a chart and you have colors next to it, 
colorblind people will have difficulties uh, seeing this. And as well as I've mentioned, some forms, when you fill them out, they will show you that the field that you missed is in red. But if you have a, a col if you are colorblind, you won't be able to see that. And now my second empathy lab is this video. It's a screen reader demo. And um, this is a very nice example how screen reader works. No one is reacting, but I can see the eyes there like, did you forget to turn on the sound? And that's the whole empathy. This is how deaf people will see your video if you don't have captions on them. And uh, yeah, the sound is not there. So it's a very nice video, I can assure you. <laughs> but I was told anyway that I can't play the sound. So um, yes, um, this is it. Uh, as I said, touching it very briefly, I would love to talk to you more about it, but we don't have more time. And I want Katarzyna to really show you examples how to, how to uh, make your language uh, plain and more accessible. And if you want to learn more, there are useful resources in my presentation um, and it will be shared with everyone. So thank you very much. And I go away with this. As I've said, accessibility is really essential for some people, but useful for all of us. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you for coming to the workshop. I am also grateful to be here. Um, as Emilia mentioned, I'm going to show you some practical examples on how to improve accessibility by better writing, better creating content. Uh, on, yes, uh, <laughs> I work as UX writer at the public IT sector. It is Center for Information Technology in Poland. And we make products like a governmental mobile app for citizens, uh, digital applica governmental applications, uh, tool for verifying uh, identity online. So we make a lot of digital services and these are pub uh, public services. So we need to make sure that they are accessible to anyone and they are useful. I am part of content design team. We are making sure that the communication within our products is as clear as it is possible. So plain language, uh, accessibility, user experience are major part of our work. Mm, and as uh, already Emilia said, accessibility is a broad subject. So today I won't be addressed every issue, uh, sadly. So I decided to choose some basic guides, essential guides uh, that every person that creates content uh, is writing digital content should be aware of. So what we are going to address today. Today, I would like to tell you a little bit about alternative text. What is alternative text and how to write it? Then I would like to tell you about importance of well-written uh, links text or headlines. Also, we will touch the subject of hierarchy of information. And by the end, I would like to give you some practical advices how to make your writing more precise, more clear. So without further ado, I would like to start the subject of alternative text. Alternative text is used to describe visual elements of digital services as an alternative for people using screen readers. When creating content, usually we include some kind of images, images that are there to illustrate something and images that are there because they are functional, for example, icons or buttons. So all these visual elements are important to our content. Uh, these elements have some kind of meaning. So we need to make sure that this meaning can be accessed by every person. 
including people who won't be able to see these elements. People who are blind or visually impaired use screen readers, which is assistive technology, to access the content of the page. Uh, simply speaking, this screen reader will, will read aloud the content of the page. So we need to make sure that when screen reader detects the image, it will be able to describe the content of the image. That's why we include alternative text. Uh, we include description to the image and we render visual information into text information. So we should include uh, alternative text when, describe, when we have images that convey some kind of meaning. If we have photo gallery, it should come with the description. If we have active thumbnails and after clicking the picture, it will expand on the whole page, then it then we also should inform about it. If we have icons, buttons, or complex images with data, all these elements should come with the description. And how can we provide alternative text? First and foremost, we have uh, something called alt attribute. When mm, code of the page indicates what kind of elements are there on the page. And uh, the same goes for images. We give information in the code that, hey, here is going to be an image. And then we provide additional information like what kind of image is going to be displayed? What, what is the size of this image? This is the place where we should also include description of this image. And this description is marked by alt attributes. Usually on your page, this description won't be visible. But it is there, and when person that is using screen reader, when the screen reader will detect the picture, the image, it will read to the person this description. Uh, every image on the page in the documents that you're creating in or PowerPoint presentation, all of it should come, should have this alternative text. It's not only for websites. Documents also should be accessible. Including such alternative text is also beneficial when uh, images on your page are broken. Sometimes it happens, uh, the page didn't load well, and then you have this blank space with broken icon. If you included a uh, description in alt attribute, then the user will see this description instead of a blank space. Also including uh, well-written alt uh, descriptions, alt texts, uh, uh, makes searching uh, better because search engines then can include in searches descriptions of these images so there's more content. Also, if you're captioning images, it is also part of alternative text. Uh, caption should be connected to the image. So there is the information about the image. Uh, in situation like this, you should remember to not double the information. Uh, if you have caption and you have some general information about the picture in the, capture, the caption, you should not write the same in alt attribute. In alt attribute, you can give more details. So as you can see in the example, caption uh, generally uh, describes the picture that we see students of the university at the graduation and alt text provides more details. What kind of people are there on the picture? What I, are they doing? But sometimes you won't be able to describe in few short sentences what is in the picture, because we usually we uh, we usually use complex images like gra graphs, uh, complicated illustrations. Uh, then every detail won't won't fit into alt attribute because alt attribute should be something short. Then you should describe such complex images in two parts. First part would be alt text, which uh, shortly informs what kind of image is that, what it regards. And then you should create a long separate description when you describe all the data from the graph, uh, you provide all relevant informations um, and you can include such a long description in various ways. 
you can create link to a separate page where uh, someone can find this description. You can include it in your content surrounding the image. You can also provide alternative way of displaying data. Uh, for example, digital maps. You can scroll the map to see marked objects, but usually you can also access a text list of all the objects marked on the map. Uh, this is alternative way of accessing the information. Uh, I told you that uh, alt text should be short, and I would like to tell you a little bit more about how to write them. So when describing image, you should do it succinctly. Uh, it should come with all important details, but it is not a place for creative story. Uh, it should be functional for the person that is accessing the content of the page. Uh, but to provide all important details, you need to know the complex uh, context and explain the context. Uh, because one image can be described in various of ways depending on the context since uh, we place images in our content for a reason. So let's take a look at the example on the slide. We have image here, and we could describe it as small tree with green leaves, and there's a lake behind it. But now let's imagine that this image is placed in article about opening of a new seasonal attraction. And this attraction is Japanese garden then this image probably is there to illustrate this attraction. So you should take it into consideration and maybe write the description as on the slide. So a fragment of a blooming Japanese garden during springtime in Wrocław city. So you should describe relevant information to the context. If this picture would be on gardening block, then probably you would focus on what kind of plants are there on the picture. Uh, sometimes it may happen that your images on the page actually doesn't have meaning because they are there to be decorative, for example, graphic dividers. Then you should not describe them since they are not conveying any meaning. You should leave alt attribute empty. And one technical advice, uh, if you are creating descriptions, uh, don't start them with image of, photo of, because screen reader already knows that the image is the image and it will announce it. So you will just double the information. And now uh, the question, is it always important to describe what the image looks like? Uh, the answer to this question is no. Uh, the answer to this question is no, because some visual elements are actually functional. You can interact with them. So if you can interact, interact with them, it is more important to explain how this interaction looks like, what will happen after inter interacting with the object, uh, than focusing on the looks of the object. It's not really important that the button is shaped like a circle. But it is important that after using it, there will be new document created. The same goes for, for example, icons or linked images. Another function, and now I would like to move to another element of the page, pages that is very common, is functional and needs to be described uh, in a uh, well manner. And I'm talking here, here about hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are important part of accessibility because links can be used to easily and quickly navigate the website. Uh, screen reader users often move from one link to another when browsing the website. They can access the list of the links to quickly search for the information. Uh, so well-written text for the link makes it easier. It makes it easier and uh, then people don't have to go through all the content when searching for specific information. But what do I mean by well-written text for the link? Uh, let's take, take a look at this example. It's badly written link, and it's quite a common phrase that we can find when uh, looking at the links on the websites. 
This is badly written link because it's meaningful, uh, meaningless outside of the context. And it should be meaningful outside of the context. Because if you are accessing just links and you're listening to these links, then if you have only general phrases, you have no idea where the links lead to, what kind of information you will access after using them. So here is example of just links and content is blurred out. The only thing that you can see is read more, read more, read more. And I don't think you can have any clue what might be uh, under these links. It would be better if they were written like this. So conditions of participation in the program, required documents list, contact details. You don't know the content of the page, but you have some kind of an idea what you will happen after um, using these links, what kind of information you will access. So now I would like to give you some tips on how to make uh, text for the link meaningful outside of the context. First and foremost, destination of the link should be clear without context. So uh, as I just presented, don't use general phrases like read more, learn more. Uh, it's not uh, very useful. Be precise uh, when describing what can be accessed by using the link. Uh, also, if you have two different website addresses, don't give them the same name because then it's not very helpful, it's confusing. Because if you see two links that are named the same, you probably will assume that they lead to the same thing, which is not the case. So once again, be precise when describing links. Also speaking about website addresses, uh, you should not pass website addresses into your content, especially if these are long and uh, meaningless website addresses. It's not very useful uh, to anyone. It's hard to scan the text uh, and look for information quickly if you have such links. It's also not very good when you have to hear all this bunch of weird characters when uh, going through the links if you are a screen reader user. So we can always hide the website address uh, by the, under the text. And it's not only for websites. When you are writing email, email creating PowerPoint presentation, uh, document in Word, PDF, uh, there's, you can always use this function to hide a uh, website address. And once again, about functionality speaking, some links uh, besides uh, leading to some information will also have some additional functionality. You should inform about it to not surprise the user. So when you are describing the link, ask yourself questions. Where does the link lead to? Does the link open in a new tab? If it does, you should definitely inform about it because if the user won't notice that the user is in the new tab and that the navigation from the previous page is no longer working, it will be confusing. Also, if a link starts the loading process, then you should inform about it and also give additional information like what type of the file is going to be downloaded and what is the size of the file. Uh, these guides are for accessibility, but also they in improve usability because all this, uh, this precision makes uh, processing the content easier to anyone, I think. Uh, another element of the pages that is very common and is important are headlines. Headlines also help to navigate the page, but also they provide semantic structure to the content. So not only screen reader users can move uh, from one title to another, from one headline to another, but also by accessing headlines, we can see the organization of the, con of the content, how it is organized. Uh, and what is important here is to remember that styling is not enough to make good headline just bolding part of the text and making it bigger, well, it's not headline. A headline will be headline if you will mark it with heading element. 
uh, you can see on the left part of the slides, a um, common way of referring to heading elements, which is H1, 2, 3, and uh, up to the 6. Uh, usually, and these are ranks of the headlines. They indicate uh, importance of the content. Also, they indicate where new section begin, what are subsections of this section. So it's important to organize the content in logical way. Uh, these heading elements usually are used in the code of the page, but also if you are using editing tools like Word, uh, you also have function of using uh, headlines there, which you should use if you want your document to be accessible. Uh, headlines also are helpful when someone is searching for specific information. It makes searching for information uh, faster, easier, and uh, doesn't require from someone digging into the content. So content of the headline uh, should be should be clear information about what can what kind of information will be accessed in the section under the headline. So don't use general phrases like learn more uh, because then it doesn't give you much information of course if you will read the first sentences of the section probably you will know but it's not very useful so look at the section and uh, in the headline give a hint of information what is in this section uh, but also remember to not make long headlines uh, it is not supposed to be another section uh, it should just be a hint what is going to, what is lying ahead. Mm, to make the content of the headlines even more precise and easier to browse, you should start sentences with keywords. So as in the example, start with the subject, require documents list, not, don't start with general phrases like list of something, uh, information about guidance on and so on, uh, because if you do it in this way, if you use keywords at the beginning, then the person after uh, seeing or hearing these two or three words, uh, the person will know what what is coming next. Also to make browsing the content even easier, place the most important information at the beginning of the page, section, paragraph. Uh, it's important uh, to making the text more scannable. And making the text is uh, more scannable is also important part of accessibility since it uh, makes searching for information easier. Uh, access to the information is easier, so it is more equal uh, regardless of the situation of the person. It makes uh, processing the information easier for people uh, with uh, learning disabilities or cognitive impairments. Uh, so you should avoid long paragraphs and uh, don't justify the content because then you have just this block of text and it's easy to lose track when reading it. Uh, write meaningful headlines, divide the content into sections and also group similar elements. If one section is somehow connected to the topic of the another section, they should be next to each other because then for the person that is processing the information, it is easier to remember the information and to connect the dots. Mm, so now, as I said before, it is the last part of the presentation. I would give you some guides on how to write more precisely, how to be more clear. So first and foremost, you should uh, write your message, messages in the way that they not require seeing something in order to uh, do something. So don't use phrases like use the button below to proceed or use the button in top right corner or see the information at the bottom of the page because all of this requires for someone actually looking for these elements and seeing it. So name precisely elements. Uh, for example, you can write use button accept to accept terms and conditions. Uh, for the same reason, you should also avoid pronouns when referring to visual objects. 
So don't write click here because not every person will know what here is. Uh, don't write click this button. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> also, obviously you should use plain language. It makes processing the information way easier. Uh, I don't need to convince you that plain language is important, but it is also a crucial part of accessibility. It makes uh, access to the information equal to any person, regardless of the situation. Also, let's remember that people are accessing our content, even if the person has no disability, people are in different situations in life and they can access, especially public information when they are in stress, they need to do something quickly, they are in rush, they're emotional. Mm, so you should not uh, increase the stress by complicated way of uh, displaying information. It should be easy for this per person to find what they need. Mm -hmm. So avoid jargon and difficult words, use active voice and write short sentences. Also, you should give hints to the user whenever it is needed, whenever you feel like it, this is the place where someone might have questions, might be lost. So uh, think about it. And also to be even more precise, uh, think about metaphors and try to avoid them which is not tricky because we tend to think with metaphors. They are deeply rooted in our language. Uh, when we have abstract objects, we usually describe them by referring to physical experiences. So for example, we have this box metaphor that we are in box or out of outside box. So we can be in love or out of place. We have transfer metaphor like passing the information, taking a hint, these are not physical objects. Uh, the same goes for metaphor top and down. Something is top, so it's probably positive. Something is down, not so positive. But processing metaphors is not easy to every person. Some people will struggle with it. Also, some people that access your content are non-native speakers. So metaphors, idioms uh, are not so obvious to them. Also, you should avoid ambiguity. And it's not so easy because when we are writing our sentences, usually we have in our heads uh, more context than our audience. We know more about what we want to convey. Uh, so it's easy to miss ambiguity and miss that the audience doesn't have access to the context that we know. So be especially careful when using, for example, pronouns, participles, or prepositional phrases, because they can invite the ambiguity. Let's take a look at these three examples. For example, we have pronouns. And the example, I want to show you my design project on the screen, but it's not working. We don't know what is not working. The screen or the design project that is not opening. Uh, when we use participles, sometimes it's not clear who is taking the action. So she went into the room with the office worker holding the papers. We didn't know who was holding the papers. And prepositional phrases, uh, he filled papers on the table. We didn't know if the papers were on the table waiting for him or he just placed them to, mm, in more convenient way, fill them. And last but not least, uh, remember that your audience is diverse and they can have uh, different uh, levels of tech literacy. So even if some terms, technical terms are obvious to you and they might, might be obvious because you're working with the product uh, every day and you uh, talk about this product with your coworkers and they understand what you're uh, talking about, so you can miss that it's not so obvious to every person. So just in case, explain technical terms. Also before using acronyms or abbreviations, use the full name first. And last, this is the subject that I could spend another half an hour talking about. Write good error messages because there's no more frustrating thing than error on the page. Uh, and uh, especially if you don't know what happened and what are you supposed to do and you were doing something important, like, for example, paying for something. 
So when writing error message, explain technical terms, explain what happened, and very important, provide solution to the problem or contact to someone that will actually help with the problem. Uh, that would be all from me. By, uh, to summarize, I would just like to emphasize that working on the accessibility is not a job of the one person. This is the work of the whole team. Every person has its own share, share to contribute, but also we are, we are not working just, you know, um, by your table and you're doing your work alone. Your work affects work uh, of other team members. So we should co communicate, cooperate, because for example, writing is strictly connected to the uh, layout of the page, of the flow of uh, digital service, of the graphical uh, things. So cooperation is crucial here. And thank you for your attention.